Hello everyone, I'm Scott Ostrowski, Vice President of Federal for Lay and AI. We're honored to have Lieutenant General Jack Shanahan, U.S. Air Force retired, as a special guest in office for us uh, to speak with us today about the benefits, challenges, and, and future of AI. General Shanahan recently retired after a distinguished 36-year career in which he commanded the squadron, group, wing, agency, and numbered Air Force levels. His final assignment was as the inaugural director of the Department of Defense Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, Jake, where he was responsible for accelerating the delivery of AI-enabled capabilities, scaling the department-wide impact of AI, and synchronizing AI activities to expand joint force advantages. He currently serves as a consultant to Layton AI on how to best deliver solutions that help speed data to decision on battlefield in real time. General, thanks for joining us today. Really excited to have you in the office. I'm thrilled to be uh, visiting today. Yeah. My, my first question, uh, as a retired Coast Guard officer, uh, I have to wonder why you chose the Air Force. Well, I love the Coast Guard. <laughs> I, I, I can't say enough good things about the Coast Guard. It just wasn't for me. I, I, wa I wanted to fly. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Uh, I, I grew up one year early in my life, about seven years old, in a place called Duxford, England where they had just filmed a movie called The Battle of Britain, and it was an old World War II airfield. First movie I've ever seen, and I'm like, that's it, I want to yeah, fly. Yeah. And then from that point on, uh, it was get into a, an airplane one way or the other. Wow, yeah, 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 wow. Looking across your career, what was the most rewarding assignment? It's a simple question, but I can't give you a simple answer. <laughs> it, the, the answer is, it depends. Um, every time I command an organization is rewarding. Um, from a squadron level all up to a 25,000 person organization. All of that was an incredible opportunity to really take care of people, lead people. On the other hand, if I think of places where I've flown, uh, Nellis Air Force Base, the Air Force Weapons School, the equivalent of the Navy Top Gun, but it would existed well before Top Gun for anybody who thinks Top Gun was first. Uh, I was an instructor out there, so that really was an opportunity to fly with the very best people in the strike yield community, F-15E fighter airplane that would come out there and by the time they graduated, they were, they were the best instructors. And that was the best flying we could ever ask for. So that was great. Um, the deployments into the Middle East, so sort of right after Desert Storm, those were rewarding for a different reason, sort of the, you're in a, an operational combat environment, um, so that was different. And then, of course, I have to point towards Project Maven, which was the shift of my career and the start of a journey on this AI path. And it was an opportunity to run a startup. And, and I say that, and people kind of laugh at me when I say I was the CEO of two AI startups in the Pentagon, and it, it is kind of true. <laughs> I had a different VC backing called Congress as opposed to <laughs> Uh, Schlein and Perkins or wherever out yeah. there trying to get, get funding from them. But it was the opportunity to start two things truly from the ground level and go, yeah. okay, yeah. what are we going to do with this thing? And everything that I learned the hard way in Maven, I brought with me into the Jake to try to not make some of those same mis mistakes. But that was a, it was such a rewarding thing because it felt um, historic to all of us yeah. uh, uh, that this was different. It was, uh, my career is, is a, a series of twists and turns, as I say, um, in a literal sense, a jack of all trades, master of none, but figurative sense <laughs> as well. That, I, that my first half of my career was in the flying side of, of the business, and then intelligence, command and control, policy, and then culminating in, in AI. It was just so different, but I knew that this was the future. And I guess that's the best way I can describe it is, uh, as hard as it was to do it, in talking with Jags and talking with you, you, you're willing to go through this process over and over again because you feel something different about trying to start something from nothing, and then all of a sudden you look around and say, "Wow, well, we, we've got a real organization here." So that, in terms of walking out the door in uniform after 36 yeah. years, that was the the reward is to yeah. say we did these two things together, and uh, it it. You put the department, I hope, on a different path. Right. And what a unique opportunity, right, to be able to actually start something in a, yeah. in a large, historic, uh, well-established organization. It, and that was so different yeah, for many yeah. people yeah. because AI was not being talked about in the Department of Defense beyond right. really the research laboratories where right. people people are out there saying, hey, we hear about this AI thing, but nobody knew what to do with it. Whereas a commercial industry... Yeah been going on for sure. 20 years. Sure. I mean, and seriously going on for, let's say, 10 to 15. And in the Department of Defense, it was, where is the AI? And that was really the genesis of Project Maven, is there was nothing out there we needed to, to get something going.
Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we definitely wanted to really dive into that, walk down that path a little bit more. Can you talk about some of the original uh, organizational objectives of, of Maven? The thing I learned that I have repeated over and over again is we did not start with an AI solution in search of a problem. We had a problem. There was no way to solve it without AI. And the problem was too much information coming off of, we'd say drones, they, they call them remotely piloted aircraft, uh, but these full motion video coming off of um, tactical drones, medium altitude drones, and no human on the planet could ever get through all the information that was coming off of these. There had to be a way to automate that process. It's mind numbing work, especially in the Middle East where we had sometimes let's say 60 patrols going on, maybe not all simultaneously, and individuals would stare at this full motion video for 12 hours at a time. It, it was impossibly hard work, mind numbing work, sheer boredom, and all of a sudden there's life and death situations right. happening. What could we do to automate as much of that pro process? Now, we didn't go straight to automation. We were thinking about augmenting and accelerating the process. Um, not to replace people right away because we had more work than we could ever give to people. So we're always going to need the people. I wanted to have the people focus on the things that humans do best. Right? You've heard, you've, you've heard how this is described. Yeah. Humans do things extremely well. Machines do things extremely well. We wanted to get the machines to process as much data as possible, let the humans think about what they were seeing. So that was our problem. And we looked around the entire Defense Department and said, what have you got? In, in sort of a startup terms, we were looking for something that would be a 40, 50x, not a 2x, right? I didn't need something a little bit better. We needed a revolution. And what could really help an Intel analyst get through that data faster? And nothing in the department was ready to be feeling. There were people working on these capabilities. They just weren't at the technology readiness level, as we say, to be fielded. We wanted to field in six months. And we did. The first um, computer vision model that a company came in and helped us with, actually it was their model, and we, we adapted it for the Defense Department, was delivered six months after we were standing up. I'm so proud of that. It was absolutely yeah. light speed, crawling by sort of some of the standards of commercial industry, light speed for the Department of Defense. Yeah. But that was the problem we were trying to solve. And from there we branched into natural language processing, and which is a little bit of a different problem, but some similarities that there were forces in the Middle East that were picking up all this stuff off the battlefield. I mean, in a literal sense, picking up thumb drives, uh, pieces of paper, whatever it was, how do you translate that as quickly as possible? Because there may be time perishable information that had to get to somebody sure, sure. or somebody, um, somebody's life could be on the line. And so we made some progress in there. So those were the two, computer vision, natural language processing at the beginning. Uh, and that was all about intelligence. Based on the lessons from that, the department looked at us as uh, as an experiment to begin with. Um, and, I, and I'll go back to what I said earlier. We had people from the outside. And there's this thing called the Defense Innovation Board, made up of people that were well, well known in industry. Eric Schmidt, first and foremost, but others like Eric that, that had been in the commercial tech business for a long time. And they came into the leadership of the department and said, what are you doing? You don't recognize what's happening in this commercial world. You're way behind. And uh, Project Maven was a demonstration. And it was good enough for the Defense Innovation Board to say, yeah, we would like to see it move faster and scale, but that's the first thing we've seen. I mean, truly, the first thing they've seen that's actually trying to do AI as opposed to a slide that said AI that wasn't really AI, which was still waterfall processes, no agile. People would claim they were doing they were not. So based on that, the uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense at the time, a guy named Bob Work, um, who had been talking about automation and AI for a few years, said, all right, let's move beyond intelligence, and how do we apply AI to the entire Department of Defense, to everything the department does? So MAVEN, as an as a function for intelligence, then became the Jake. Now, Maven still existed. It was, it was in, a, in an Intel organization in the, in the Pentagon. The Jake was to do everything else. So those two yeah, yeah. entities um, follow each other. So one's focused on the Intel part, and we were doing everything else. And I was asked um, if I wanted to, or would I, uh, be the first director of the Jake? And I said no, because <laughs> I knew how hard it was going to be. Because I and I knew. It would be all the lessons we, we learned yeah, the hard way yeah. in Maven. They asked again, and I said no again. And then the Secretary of Defense said, well, would you reconsider? <laughs> At that point, Secretary of Defense, a guy named Jim Mattis, asked, and you generally say, I'll do that for my country, uh, Secretary <laughs> Mattis. And so I said yes. Um, and, yeah. and, and I couldn't I couldn't say no. I wanted to say no, but I couldn't, because I knew how damn important this sure, was. Sure. And, and it was an opportunity to take all those things I've learned 
and start building a new organization to do everything other than the intelligence piece of it. Can you speak to as you that scale that transition as well? Kind of your second startup now, yeah. right? So take us some of the lessons learned from your first startup. And by the way, it sounded very much like a startup. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Six months MVP, forty yeah. x return, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Agile development cycle, etc. Yeah. Taking that from from Project Maven now expanding that to the department level, yeah. a second startup, but you now in a even larger, uh, more established. So there, so there was good and there was there was pain. And so the good is I knew kind of how I wanted to build the organization. But I said, I need test and evaluation. So we, I said, we're going to stand up test and evaluation. I said, we need some red team. We're going to do red team. I need an intelligence function. We're going to do intelligence. Test and evaluation, red team, all these things. I knew what they needed to be. I just didn't have the resources to do it. And, and you, it's a typical startup story that we went from four people and no money and no place to work out of. By the time I retired, 18 months later, we had about 150 people, had a $1.4 billion five-year funding line, and had grown out of a, a facility, so we needed a second building. And I was very proud of that because that is a, actually, we, we moved almost too fast because you couldn't handle that scaling. On the pain side, I only got a couple of people to bring over with me from Maven. So I ended up not being able to go out and choose. Like, you know, startup CEO and co-founders would go out and say, Hey, I want this person, this person, this person. They would hand pick their team. Happens every day in this country. I had people hand it to me. And they didn't, for the most part, understand AI. They just happened to be the right grade at the right time. Like, okay, this person's about to retire. Here you go, get them. Um, I loved it. I loved the team. We, we, I just, it was one of those, we were in it together. We were all plank holders. You built this sense of identity. But it was different than Maven, where it was a smaller, tighter team yeah. that had this elite feeling to it because you grew from nothing. But this, it grew very rapidly. It was hard to sort of keep your arms around yeah. the whole thing. So we did have to learn a lot of things over again, um, which is never easy to do, especially when you've been through it and you know it's coming. You want to do the slow motion thing is, don't, don't do it. <laughs> but it's going to happen and yeah. you just got to be ready yeah. for it yeah. and you got to pick up the pieces and move on. <laughs> so that was that was the big difference. But on the other hand, yeah. this was a big deal now because this is, this is for... Yeah. Moving beyond intelligence, this is the whole Department of Defense. Everybody was looking at us. Congress was looking at us. The, the news media was looking at us. The building was looking at us. So there was a lot of pressure on to do that. So uh, we were very focused uh, on that in that 18 months before I retired. Yeah. You mentioned uh, staffing, staff development, training, particularly around cutting edge technologies, yeah. AI, ML. Uh, can you speak about you know, how you overcome some of those challenges and, and frankly, even how we can build some of that into? Uh, the digital ego space today. Yeah, so it has to be done at a much much earlier level. So uh, my, my push for this is education and training happens at the entry level. It needs to happen when somebody comes in and, and is a brand new uniform or, or civilian. Uh, on the civilian side is get them exposed to some of these concepts as early as possible. Yeah. Now, the digital part is much easier now than getting someone that's been in a military for 30 years but has no, right. no understanding of AI because they've never been exposed to AI, whatever their background was. In this case, we're going to see a generational shift over the next decade where you now have people that understand all the core concepts. What they don't know is how to apply it to a military. So what I'm focused was focused on at the time is how do we get people trained and do some education as early as possible and then develop them through their careers like you saw with Cyber Command. And it took them a while to understand if you train somebody in, in uh, cyber specialty, you didn't want to remove them three years later and send them back to, say, flying because you couldn't lose that valuable skill set. There's not enough of it. And that's what the case is. For sure, that's the case with AI. To an order of magnitude, uh, more problematic than with cyber, because there's yeah. just so few people out there that are deep in AI, including myself. I mean, it, every day I was I learned something new. And, and I, I had conversations with people in Silicon Valley. They could have been speaking Mandarin in those early days, because I didn't understand them, they didn't understand me. So I learned over time how to translate, and they learned how to speak DOD speak. But that was, uh, it really really was about how do you um, train people um, on these on these basic concepts of what can this what can this capability do 
but also what it can't do because right. the hype is crazy, right? right, right. Uh, you just need concrete examples of this is what it can do for you, and here's its limitations. Right, right. It's not magic, right? Statistics, probability, yeah. mathematics, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> yeah. So that was uh, that. That was the beginning of that of yeah. that journey. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, Jake has since also transitioned organizationally, realigned to CDIO. Um, Recognize this a little bit after your time. Can you speak to maybe a little bit of, again that organizational objectives and, and that transition? And yeah, uh, so the real org made perfect sense to me because you had three entities you had the Jake and you had the chief data officer that reported to somebody else. But of course, AI and data are completely interlinked, so you really should be looking at those together. And then you had this third organization called the Defense Digital Service or DDS, yeah. mm-hmm. they were known for being run by uh, the sort of this iconoclastic um, Chris Lynch. Um, whose whole persona was designed to shake people to their boots in the Pentagon. He'd walk around with a hoodie and pink sneakers and all this, and people are like, who is that crazy guy? <laughs> but he did that for a very specific reason. Their mission was to sort of go do things really fast, on the, on, mostly on the cyber side, like hacking. Like uh, he would go black hat or white hat and find out vulnerabilities in weapon systems. But they were tending to go do the projects uh, for, for whatever reasons, where it wasn't necessarily always aligned with the broader DOD goals on AI and data. So putting those three entities together under a single person made great sense. Uh, not, now the question is, you know, are they advancing all the things we started to work on? Sure, That's a, sure. I, I'm not in position to answer answer yeah, that sure, question. Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, starting to look ahead as well. What I uh, want to both look near term and maybe vision cast a little bit further out. But near term, where do you see as kind of the immediate opportunities for AI ML uh, within the within the department? Yeah, here's here's my way of saying this. Um, there is no DoD mission that could not be improved by AI. Uh, from undersea to outer space, cyberspace, and everything in between. Everything is right. Now, is AI always the best answer? That's okay. That, that's a good question to ask. Yeah. Back to my don't go um, with an AI solution and search for a problem. What problems do you have? And can A, so you have to, you know what the, the standard sequence is. Everybody in this company knows how to answer these questions is what data do you have? What kind of data? What can you do with that data? Okay, what kind of model are you looking for? How do we train that model? How do we feel that model? How do we continue to sustain, update that model? Those are all questions that have to be asked, but there is no mission that I can think of that could not be improved. The question is priorities. What we did in the Jake is is take a very deliberate um, process of going with the lower consequence, lower risk missions first. Completely understandable, right? If you got it wrong, there was not a high risk of something dramatic going wrong. Uh, so one of our first ones was uh, helicopter maintenance. There were sensors on these helicopters that we used a, a, a machine learning uh, model to be able to give some sort of predictive capability why, when that model might be, you know, probabilistic, might be approaching sort of end of life or a part might be failing. Um, that was not going to be devastating if that model didn't work exactly perfectly. But everything we learned from that, we started moving up the what I would call the food chain into the warfighter things, like the what we would call sensor to shooter. So a sensor and then trying to somebody's going to end up making a decision to release a weapon. That is far more consequential. It's also higher risk. It's also harder. So we had to kind of jump into that a little bit differently than jumping into sort of some of those early use cases, including medical. We were doing some I thought fascinating, um, interesting work on digitizing joint pathology center slides, which were old slides with little samples on them. You digitize them, you come up with a, a machine learning, deep learning model, and be able to then analyze new samples to say that might be this this disease. And so that was, I love doing that kind of stuff. Uh, it was mostly below the headlines because people want to get focused on the killer drones and all those things. So uh, it was sort of a stair-step approach. As we got more and more comfortable, you take on bigger and bigger. bigger yeah, I see remember so, search and rescue or, or firefighting as well. There's yeah, yeah, so, so, so that was a big, yeah, yeah. our early days, we called it HADR, Humanitarian Assistance right. Disaster Relief. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it was, it was yeah. I think, such a good mission. One, because the country was having a real problem with wildfires and hurricanes on the East Coast. Right, right. So you, it, everything was there except for locusts. You were just waiting for the locusts. <laughs> it was like the summer of, the, of, all the, of all the bad things that could happen. But this firefighting stuff was really interesting yeah. work. And you could, you were use, we were using semantic segmentation to see where that fire line was. It was. And it was working. And the nice part about that was it was somewhat fungible to other combat operations. Right. Yeah. So you start with one use case, but you find that it's got applicability to other use cases yeah. out there that may be more 
or fighting oriented. Right. So that was the that was a good uh, way to develop a capability, and everybody was interested in that. Who's going to yeah. object? Yeah. There are a lot of people who object to um, autonomous weapon systems. Sure, sure. Nobody objects that I've found yet to finding a way to map out where the wildfires yeah. are going to be. Yeah. As we look outside, see the haze from the Canadian. Yeah. 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 Out there today. Save lives. Yeah. Protect yeah. Americans. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And search and rescue yeah. is a big yeah. one. You yeah. being from the Coast Guard, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. you know how hard it is to try to find somebody yeah. bobbing in the sea that's fallen yeah. off a boat. Yeah. I would love to have some yeah. kind of computer vision model that says right. there's something there. That's right. Okay, now we go yeah. focus all our attention right there. Because yeah. you, otherwise, you're going to miss it. Yeah, and you talk about complex mathematical models, uh, significant variables, set drift. Oh, God. Right? Yeah, yeah, crazy, crazy, crazy yeah, hard to yeah, do yeah. it. Now throw nighttime yeah. and weather in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and, and yeah. you're yeah. talking to somebody that might only have 24 yeah. hours to live yeah. in that water. Yeah. 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 So that I always was... was Deeply interested in that. And then I think there's all these things that are that don't get a lot of attention at all, but are equally important is all the back office stuff, the finance stuff, the personnel things. Mm -hmm. All all of that could be improved, either by general process automation, which has sure, sure. sort of become trivial these days compared to some of these advanced capabilities. Yeah. But now even the generative AI, what could we be doing with yeah. that? And I think the department just needs to move a lot faster yeah, yeah. than it is moving to be willing to um, take some more risks, yeah. move faster. Yeah experiment a little bit more, give people some environments to go play around in, and then learn from those and then say, okay, we got it, now we want to see this, yeah, this, and this. Yeah, sure. So it's a, it, it's, been, it's been a slower than desired process, but on the other hand, I look back and go, where was it six years ago and where is it today? It's made a lot of strides. Yeah, autonomy included. Right? Yes, you know, yeah, autonomy yeah, 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 yeah. Throughout the DoD. That's right. Yeah, kind of building on that and, and looking ahead. You you mentioned generative AI. Certainly, autonomy is a, is a major focus of the DoD. Uh, longer term, where do you see as as opportunities for AI ML within the department? Yeah, so I think every every system that's going to be built for the Department of Defense and maybe yeah, yeah, I'll say yeah. even broadly, just speaking, national security yeah. enterprise will have some capability baked yeah. into it and and should have some. What is exactly that capable? I don't know yet. Um, my experience was we were bolting this stuff on because it wasn't built with it, and, which is understandable. Nobody had any kind of idea how to build this thing from the beginning. And the, we're always going to have situations where you have to add on some capability. But what I'd like to see, and I know it's a big part of the discussions with, with the team today, is how do I get to these what we call program offices in the military and design these capabilities in from the start, knowing that they need to be continuously updated. That's fine, but I'd rather build it with an AI capability from the beginning rather than to go through this tortuous process much later in 20 years down the road and say, how do we add this cutting edge yeah. capability to a 20-year-old system? There is a clash there, and, and you plateau very quickly about where you can get optimal performance. So I, I would like to see these things really designed from the beginning. And I know yeah, yeah. I know latent AI is out there talking to the program offices, which is the right place to be, to begin to understand how we make this in from the, from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, great insights. Um, from a... Uh, uh, Transitioning a little bit from really the, the department to how, how we can do business with the department. I uh, really just want to start with, with just dual use, or we've heard defense tech uh, mm -hmm. as kind of a new term as well. Any advice based on your engagement with industry when in uniform for how we can engage or small businesses can engage with the department in particular? Yeah, so, so a couple of, couple of things. This is a, such an important point is there's been a shift in the defense department in the last, I'd say, 10 years. I'll say 10 years is good, close enough. The de Defense Department has been very comfortable for decades working with a certain number of defense contractors, what we call the primes, you're all familiar with the Boeings, the Lockheed's, Raytheon's, whatever, who built things for the Defense Department. We are now talking about technology that was being designed for commercial purposes first and foremost, and then being adapted for defense purposes. That is so different than what the Defense Department's used to doing that they're having trouble figuring out how to adjust to that model. Um, we're never going to go back to the days of, say, the early 1970s where there were whatever, 30,000 software coders. People want to bring those days back. My answer to that is, why would we? One, you're not going to get them. And two, this is what commercial business does extremely well. You have people who do this for a living. Why don't you take the capabilities that already exist and adapt them for the Defense Department? So the philosophy we built under Maven that I carry with me into the J and have never come off of is commercial first. Let's go with a commercial solution if it already exists. The answer some people will give to that is, wait a minute, we have these niche special capabilities. 
those are very small numbers sure. of, of things, problem sets that will be ultra classified. And even then, my guess is there's commercial capability that then can be brought inside the, 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 the walls of the yeah. secure building and then adapt it. So this is, this is different enough that the department's trying to figure out how to kind of change the whole model of bring it in commercially and adapt it as quickly as possible. That's, that is a, not a usual way of operating for a lot of people. So what I'm, so what I'm trying to um, advocate for is one of the reasons I'm so yeah. excited about working with Leighton AI is to be able to take companies that are doing unbelievably important work that already are focused on national security, but because the government moves so slow, they've got to go commercial first, but those same capabilities can be ported over to the, to the defense side. And even more so if you then have, say, big defense primes that are working with companies like um, Leighton AI, where now you really have the best of both. You've got the big companies that know how to work with, with um, the government, they know what security clearance is all about. They know the Byzantine acquisition process, which nobody understands, but the primes actually understand it really well. But you can bring in these capabilities that Leighton AI is offering on the on the AI side and bring those things together in a way where truly the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That's what I love seeing. That was what I am I'm really excited awesome. about. Awesome. Yeah, and you, you spent the day with us. We definitely appreciate yeah. the time to deep dive with our engineering team, uh, with, with us on the sales side and customer engagement side as well. Um, wanted to, to really transition more to a little bit around late. You're fairly selective in, in terms of who you consult with and how you engage with companies. So what, what made Layton AI different? What's the value prop that you saw in us yeah, in yeah. terms of the engagement? Well, I am, one, I, I'm very careful because uh, I, First of all, I don't want to make it look like I'm out selling selling my soul to, to the highest bidder. So money does not matter to me. It's not, not why I get interested in this. So there are two things I always think of, the mission and the people. And, and Jags, the conversation I had with him at the very beginning, I know he was trying to get in touch with me, and we finally connected. And it was apparent to me immediately, here's, a, here's somebody that cares so deeply about the national state. He's passionate about it. And it's always, and to me, it's always like this, the second generation immigrant story, which is so compelling, like I want to give back to this country um, and not nearly enough people that I run to that, that are a more comfortable background say, oh, no, we're, we're good. This is somebody that is driven by helping uh, the national security enterprise and wants to make a difference. So that's the people side. And then everybody I met today is equally passionate about this mission and then the mission itself. So so what I knew before I walked in the door today was one thing, and then I, I've actually learned more about some of the capabilities you bring that don't exist anywhere that I know of right now. And that may be a overly broad statement, but it's what I know. And that first piece of it that was immediately of interest to me is the edge piece of it. We're going to be fighting in environments in the future, and this is something we could not solve either in Maven or Jake because we could not get through the power, size, weight, and power requirements to be able to put some of these uh, models on uh, platforms and sensors. All the analytics was being done at ground stations. And that was because that's where the analysts were. But it was obvious to us at the time that that fight of the future will be in a, an environment where you're gonna be disconnected, you're gonna have people trying to jam you, attack you, cyber attack you, physically attack you. You may not have access to cloud for days, if not maybe months at a time. I need to have capabilities at that edge. And define edge, people, you know, different ways to define edge. But I would say from a theater level all the way down to an individual somewhere. And that person may be in a building doing cyberspace, maybe on a ship, maybe in an airplane. They've got to have the capability to be able to do that work on their platform or sensor itself. So that was so important to me. And then this other piece that I, that I heard today that I just wasn't familiar enough with is sort of this optimization based on device. So the idea of, of being able, just the chart example, of, hey, I want to know what combination of performance versus speed versus may cost based on this environment, this device, and I just can go click, and that's the solution we're going to go with. And you've already built that solution. So the idea of, of being able to pull off the shelf, basically a marketplace, for lack of a better term, and say, nope, for this, uh, for this um, uh, Android, we need this. For this um, analyst environment that works on a very high-end GPU-driven workstation, this will work fine. But all of that has already been done and optimized. That's the that's the secret sauce, right? And you've built sort of an ML ops platform that is also, as we were talking about, the scaffolding piece of it. So you've got a you've got an architecture piece. 
you've got an um, optimization piece, and you've got the edge work. Those three are, to me, is where we always wanted to go. We just couldn't get there. We got there because we weren't advanced enough yet, because we didn't, we couldn't solve side weight and power, and there wasn't people didn't have the techniques that that you have at Lake May I um, that really say we can now do this on the edge. Awesome. If uh, kind of looking back on the day, what you already talked about some of the things you've learned and, and exciting. What what do you think most exciting about Lay and AI, and in particular our ability to support the department? Well, I think just making a difference in the national yeah. security enterprise, and and, and it's not just DoD. Uh, it's the intel community, which uh, yeah, nineteen sure. different agencies or, or, or organizations, but even beyond that, Department of Energy. There are so many other parts of the government that are all sort of slowly trying to get into this space. The DOD, we were pushing hard because, one, it was the DOD. You had a lot of money, you had a lot of emphasis, a lot of priorities. But the other parts of the government have to move along. I would love to see Leighton AI help make a difference in every part of that whole enterprise. The whole government, but for sure on the national security enterprise. Because these are the capabilities that are needed today, um, especially if we look at a fight. You know, whether whether the fight happens or not, we all hope it doesn't fight or happen. But if we look at a fight with China in the next five to ten years, these capabilities are going to be critical because uh, we're going to have a, a, a threat that will be as advanced as any threat we've ever faced in our history that will be equally um, well-versed on technology, that will know how to come after our technology. So the idea of latent AI security, the idea of encryption and watermarks and some of the other capabilities you showed me today are all going to be selling points to the national security enterprise. So uh, to me, it's about just making a difference. And it, and it may be just enough of a difference, right? But we're not going to claim that um, this is going to change the game overnight. I refuse to use the words revolution when talking about some of these capabilities because history shows over and over again that's never true. What happens is you get a relative advantage. And that relative advantage may be enough where you win the fight, win the battle, win the war, whatever, or lose if we're not ready for it. So that's a very, very grandiose view of this. Yeah. But I think on a, on a micro level, it's just day to day, how do you make better performance yeah. at that edge? Yeah, 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 thank you. Earlier in the day, you talked about uh, kind of the flywheels, right, mm -hmm. of, of how fast certain organizations spin versus others and gaining that uh, unique competitive advantage at, at that point in time. Uh, could you just expand on that? It feels like kind of a, a natural segue to, to yeah. what you just described. So it's, it's, I know we talked a little bit about, some people describe this as the OODA loop, the yeah. observe, orient, decide, act. Uh, others kind of talk a, a, of a decision cycle. So the idea of you may have gears, and I just used the, the analogy of gears, as you visually can get this picture of a big gear that generally might be turning at a certain speed in a lower gear, or at least a smaller gear, turning at a much higher RPM. It really doesn't matter exactly what speeds those are other than one is faster than the other. <laughs> it's it's the, I, all I need to do is run faster than you to get away from the bear. Uh, it's, it's, I just wanna go through that decision cycle faster, which means I have to have good information not perfect information, good information, delivered in as rapidly as possible, and give that to a human to make a decision. Sometimes it may be a machine action that just does, it just happens, because the speed of, let's say, cyber, that I have to protect myself against cyber attack, and the only way I can do that sometimes may be I need an automated response. So we're under attack, we're gonna counter attack. And a human has already decided, like the day before, as soon as that attack happens, you're clear to do it. So somebody has made a decision as a human. Um, I think that's going to happen, but I also think there'll be situations where a human's still going to be very much in that decision process about launching a weapon that will take a life. And so that, I'd love for a human to have as much time as possible to think about the consequences of that. What does that mean? Let the machine do everything else as quickly as possible. Give more time back to the human. Is that a little bit Pollyannish? Maybe. But it's preferable to what we have today, which is a human is struggling to process information because it's too much information from too many sources at all sources of classification. By the time they even begin to absorb it, it's over. They're, they've lost. So let the machine crunch through that data as fast as possible and secure. It has to be secure because it will be attacked. And then the human does what a human does best, which is what? Inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, abductive reasoning, cognitive processing. We're nowhere close to that. Even with generative AI, as much as it's hype, we do not have AGI on the horizon. I'm sorry, we don't. I refuse to accept that. So human thinking is as important as ever. But I want to give more time to the humans to think about the things they really should be thinking about. Not 
warning about, I just can't process this information. And then what do you do? You revert to just looking at one source of information, which may be false or whatever. So I, I just, I think we've got to give um, um, credence to the idea of this is not about replacing humans. In some cases, we'll see humans replaced by machine. But for the most part, in war, it's about humans making big consequential decisions and doing it with the best possible information and having the time to process it. And I think there's certainly a role for ML ops in that process. Completely. Right? The ability to, Completely. to iterate on those models yeah, yeah. and all that. Yeah, so, so and, and this was a big part of our discussion kind of this morning was, this is the world I came from in Project Maven with Jake, is the Department of Defense, which I can speak very specifically about, as opposed to the rest of the government, was not prepared and is not fully prepared for this idea of CICD of like, hey, I got version one of the model, but I need version 12, 12 days later. Right now in hardware, you get version 2.0 four years later, over schedule, <laughs> over budget, and it's a disaster. Here it's like, oh no, I need to process that update quickly. And so the faster I can get through that ML ops cycle to include the test and evaluation piece, which I heard so many good things today about um, the watermarking, the security, the accreditation, whatever you want to call it, that's got to be part of the process. This is no longer Netflix recommendations. This is life or death, so you better have a secure application. But you want to do that faster than the adversary. So the idea of, of fielding one model and leaving it alone for six months, is never, it should never be allowed ever again. You might as well not do AI at that point. Just go back to your old Excel spreadsheets if that's your idea. Instead, you got to be getting models out updates over and over and over again, but you need a process to do that. And you, you are building a process to do exactly that. And how you work with other companies that are, that are actually building their models and then bringing those into the government with you at, at that design and development process, so you built your capabilities in from the very beginning, now those things are out uh, at the edge and working as advertised. Even as, as you described today, and this gets a little bit more complicated, but I actually believe in this vision, is at that edge place that someday somebody's going to have that ability to do that right there, right, without having to go back to get permission um, um, at Big Pentagon or somewhere, wherever that is. It's like, no, you have to, you have to do that here. And you'll have some parameters, some maybe I'll call them guardrails, that you can, you can do these, this level of change. If it goes beyond that, you got to notify someone because it may be maybe a really big change that somebody else needs to know about. But we have got to be in position to be able to do that at the lowest possible level. And we need experts at that level. And we don't have experts at that level. So it goes back to the education, training, and getting people smart that are deployed down at that, that unit level to say, oh, no, no, I got this. I got this. Now, they also got, they've signed something that says they're accountable for it. Like something goes wrong, okay, you're on the hook. But that's all right. We're all used to doing that in the military. Somebody's on the hook. I was on the hook in the airplane. Um, Intel, you know, hey, I, I could be fired at any any moment. I understood that's part of part of the price of, of doing command. So that's that, I, I really like that part of it is that ML ops cycle being fast, fast enough. Yeah. And what is fast enough? I don't know yet. <laughs> Maybe when, um, just faster than the other side or something like that. So that's kind of my thoughts on it. Perfect. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, General, we really appreciate your time. I appreciate your insights. Uh, it's been a fantastic day. Uh, you visiting us here in the office and excited about the opportunity to partner with you moving forward, bringing ML Ops into, into the national security sector. Yeah. Um, I love what you're doing. Um, I, I really, I, I have not joined many companies. I won't just, really, this is the, the only true advisor role that I've taken on because I, I think you're onto something important here and it will make a big difference. So it's, uh, Thank I'm, you. I'm extremely happy to come up in person and actually you. You know, see it here and, and go, yeah, it's real. <laughs> it's Thank real. you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks.